Um, thank you, everyone here in the assembly. Uh, thank you to Five Funk for the invitation to speak. Uh, thank you to Andy, actually, uh, as well, for <laughs> setting this whole thing up. Uh, so this talk is part one, three parts. My name is Gary. Ude will be speaking. Ben will also be coming up. Uh, and we are a small fraction of a group called Toronto Mesh. And this title for talk is called DIY Networks in Toronto. Um, this was delivered about a year ago at another conference called Radical Networks in New York. And this talk is more or less a concatenation and a really condensed version of that talk in which we talk about uh, Toronto, which is where we are coming from, and North America, which is the continent that we call home. Um, so. Toronto is uh, a place of a lot of different things. I think one of the main landmarks that has really been kind of cemented in people's minds is the CN Tower. And <laughs> in, in many ways, CN Tower is a landmark of the city, but it's also a really important piece of infrastructure that has made itself known as sort of the defining thing that, that Toronto is known for. Um, in some ways, it's a really interesting piece of infrastructure because it's built for communication. It was originally the site of a major train hub, and at a point in the city's history, line of sight was incredibly important for buildings and for uh, businesses to operate. In the CN Tower, there are many different wireless technologies that are kind of rooted in this structure specifically. But we're not going to be talking about the CN Tower. Is there? Visit it when you have the chance to come to Toronto. But know that it is an important piece of infrastructure that has been the cemented thing that we are kind of talking around when we come to talking about networks in Toronto, specifically DIY ones that we have um, interacted with. Um, we also recognize that Toronto is, uh, has many layers of infrastructure. This is uh, a photo of a conduit being installed in, along a major um, artery of the city many years ago. But uh, the thing to take away from this is to know that Toronto is a layered city of many different pieces of conduit, wireless signals, people, roads, sidewalks, Anything in that uh, spectrum of things that make up a city are baked into Toronto. Um, mind you, it, probably less of a historical kind of backstory compared to places in Europe, but um, still is something that we kind of think about. And this is kind of rooted in why we are talking about uh, ecologies and history of Toronto networks, uh, knowing that these pieces of infra infrastructure has been really important into shaping the way that Toronto has built out in its, uh, in its form. Um, Toronto in itself has many different infrastructure projects one of which is this, the One Zone project, which we're not going to dive too much into. But uh, know that there has been many attempts to create uh, Wi-Fi, uh, readily available Wi-Fi across the city. And so this attempt was done through Toronto Hydro, which had then been passed off to a cable telecom company called Kojiko. Um, but the interesting thing with this particular network is that this is a mesh network, mind you, a dormant mesh network, uh, where uh, there are access points that are running on the BG channels, but also uh, a backhaul channel of uh, the A channel in which these nodes uh, communicated with. And this tied into Toronto Hydro's infrastructure in that the light poles were electrified and also a fiber line that strings across the downtown core uh, was utilized in order to provide these access points across the city or at least within the downtown region. So uh, this is one of our remaining kind of evidences uh, of uh, networks in Toronto. And um, the interesting thing with this particular node is that there were three models. And this is sort of a barrel configuration that was built in partnership with Siemens uh, in Ottawa. So we're not going to be talking about this, though there are some really interesting implications of this network becoming live once again. But there is a whole um, kind of dormant kind of legislative municipal um, kind of backstory which needs to be festered out in order for this to actually be realized uh, again today. 
Um, what we're also not going to be talking about is this, which is a node uh, or rather access point for our uh, TTC, our transit system, which has recently become uh, Wi-Fi ready um, after a long-winded battle. Um, but know that there are these kind of free Wi-Fi hotspot infrastructure being placed across the city through these major networks of municipal transportation and uh, of uh, larger citywide uh, projects. Um, what we're mainly interested in is this uh, narrative that was started by Cory Doctorow, um, written sometime in 1995, where this particular book describes a scenario where two of the main characters creates a Wi-Fi mesh network in a really specific particular part of Toronto called Kensington Market. Um, part of the narrative is that the character goes around scavenging for um, software, uh, hardware, and creates um, a mesh network using these pieces of found hardware and also uh, with a backbone link to one of our IXPs, um, 151 Front Street. So this was the basis or narrative that has played out again with uh, a project called Wireless Nomad, again in 2006, where uh, a mesh network was created in Kensington Market par as a parallel to this, <laughs> this book where uh, where readily available Wi-Fi internet access was provided by um, by an individual or a group of individu individuals. Um, the project has since been um, sold off to a larger ISP, but the interesting aspect of this is that there has been this kind of aspiration and this kind of manifestation of a network, specifically a mesh network in Toronto um, that has yet to be fully realized again uh, to this day. Um, in addition to uh, that narrative of the mesh network in Kensington Market, uh, there were also larger scaled uh, nationwide networks such as Teledon. A Teledon could be drawn as a parallel to something like Minitel in Paris, I mean here in France, where uh, it's a one-way network where content is delivered to uh, television nodes, and there is an interface for these terminals that are connected via a uh, telephone network. Um, the aspiration for Teledon was to provide uh, multimedia content to these uh, television terminals. Um, there was an input device to navigate through these content carousels. And uh, part of it was to provide information like uh, tourism information or uh, weather or places to shop when you come into the city. Um, this particular photo was taken in Toronto where nodes were installed in different kind of landmark tourist areas and one could navigate um, a kind of rudimentary navigation structure in order to find information relevant to what they're looking for. Um, as a kind of byproduct of this network, um, this uh, created uh, a specific uh, kind of language in which shapes and artifacts or graphic artifacts can be drawn um, with relative ease compared to the character based uh, Minitel uh, teletext implementation. And uh, Canadian artists uh, have made use of this in creating some of the pre internet web net art um, that we have uh, been kind of knowing or been observing for the past couple of years with the conception of the internet. Um, but through Teledon um, and through the creation of this uh, kind of graphics language, um, Canadian artists were creating unique content on the web. And so this uh, YouTube video is uh, kind of a reflection of that, of various artists who were operating, um, mainly in Toronto, um, creating these uh, really interesting early net art uh, pieces. Um, it's also worth noting that the, or the uh, organization that uh, has spawned this is still in existence called InterAccess. Um, and a lot of the uh, artifacts that came out of this period have been preserved in uh, various uh, institutions in Toronto. Um, one of the other things that we did uh, in a previous year of this talk was visit the York University Computer History Museum. 
Uh, the museum is a beautiful place. I'm not going to get too much into it, but given this kind of front facade, you can see that there are a lot of artifacts, uh, one of which is the IP Sharp terminal, which is, again, an early, ti early time sharing network in Toronto. Uh, but our main focus was to do with the NABU network, which was an ongoing, or which is an ongoing preservation activity project at the museum. And so our guide, Ziggy, um, has uh, really diligently showed us uh, this amazing network which delivered content through, again, these terminals. Um, but the important part of it is that this is all Canadian content and it is all trying to be, to be preserved through uh, this kind of emulated environment at York University. So here, when we visited the, the museum, where we're looking at these different network services, and uh, he guided us through this whole experience of navigating this early internet uh, that was created in Canada. In this case, uh, or in this uh, photo, we see that this is like a navigation structure for navigating the news, um, but there was also content related to finding things like the latest showtimes for movies, um, the what, uh, looking up the, the uh, alcohol if you need alcohol, or um, and then other really kind of niche parts of it is to do with these kind of intermediate moments where between loading of content, we get these pop-up ads or something that is analogous to pop-up ads. Uh, in this case, uh, a 50% off logo manual so you can um, learn logo <laughs> potentially along the way. Um, Naboo uh, ultimately didn't carry on and um, has been succeeded by the internet, but there have been plenty of stories around this network in that uh, there was a lot of aspiration for delivering really specific content um, and uh, unique experiences through licensing of games from places like uh, Atari. Um, unfortunately, this did, didn't quite follow through, but some of the earlier, or, or some of their attempts to kind of realize this network has been kind of a predecessor for a lot of the things that we're going to be talking about with uh, Toronto Mesh and uh, of networks in Canada and North America. So here is a, a diagram of uh, the general kind of schematic of what is happening. So uh, there is a centralized data center in which data gets fed into uh, the coaxial cable that gets transmitted to the home. The home uh, makes use of these terminals which decode, so the bottom part of the uh, of the monitor is uh, the term, the NABU terminal, which decodes that data and presents it into this navigatable form. Um, interesting part of this network as well is that this, they made an attempt to broadcast the NABU network across uh, quite a number of kilometers to uh, Calgary. And I believe this was one of the first early attempts at using satellite in order to transmit information uh, across vast distances. Um, and then that brings us to uh, a more recent project um, something that we've kind of reflected as an extension of uh, Toronto Mesh, uh, Wireless Toronto. And in 2005, similar to the parallels of Cory Doctor's book, um, a group of individuals decided to uh, basically turn these Lynx's WRT54GL routers into access Wi-Fi hotspots with monitoring so that uh, local businesses and BIAs are able to create free and open Wi-Fi for people to use. Um, the project itself is um, has been relatively dormant. Uh, some of the nodes are still in existence. They're still broadcasting their SSIDs. And um, it was pointed to us this particular article, which kind of embody some of the thinking behind uh, why this project came to be and what the aspirations are. Um, just to quickly go over this, uh, it's not just about providing free Wi-Fi, it's about people get, getting people out of their houses and offices into the street. And it's about having community-run infrastructure and not rely on big, big telcos for access. It allows and encourages location-based content via portal pages for, at each hotspot. The internet is no longer just a thing you connect to. It becomes slightly different at different places. It becomes a part of your surroundings. And then by extension, um, they made a call for more artists, curators, community groups to experiment with technologies and for low-cost low options for sharing knowledge and uh, augment uh, cultural opportunity into this kind of space of um, Wi-Fi. 
Um, this is an artifact displaying all the nodes that were deployed. Um, a lot, these nodes were owned and operated by communities uh, and businesses in Toronto. Uh, some of them are still in existence, like this one, which has been strapped to a uh, building in Toronto um, and uh, continues to broadcast. But th this particular scenario it, uh, in which you're able to still see that the hotspot is not always the case. And unfortunately, you're not able to connect to this particular one because of a issue with a DHCP server. But there are cases where Wires Toronto hotspots are still in existence and are still broadcasting. And uh, Udit will be coming up to talk about our current media landscape. Hello. Hi. Hey. Um, so Gary has kind of set up the talk with talking about the rich history of DIY networks in Toronto. Um, I just want to fast forward to the present and for uh, the benefit of our European, European friends here, I just want to talk about the state of internet in Canada today. Um, um, so the, the Berkman Center for uh, Internet and Society has said that Canadian internet is one of the slowest and most expensive internet in the developing world. Um, and the two reasons that are given for this are an over-reliance on competition, uh, uh, over-reliance on, on uh, 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 yeah, over-reliance on competition is the main reason that's given for this. Um, and you can see here that the, the, the uh, in this in this in this chart that's the uh, total uh, telecommunications revenue by ownership. Most of it is is concentrated within the five uh, largest telecommunications service providers in Canada. Um, and as a response to CRTC, which is uh, the equivalent body uh, to the FCC in the U.S. Uh, has, has said access to broadband internet service is a uh, vital and a basic necessity for, um, uh, for, for Canadians. And one of the things that they've done is, um, uh, is, uh, is, is, is instituted open access to hard to reproduce infrastructure uh, in Canada. Although uh, this, is, this, is, this has been really challenging because of uh, uh, the regulatory um, uh, uh, the confidence that they've given, because they've, they've said that this access might be curtailed in the future. So because of a lack of competition coming from smaller groups, um, this hasn't really translated into more ISPs coming about. Um, um, also, net neutrality in the U US has been a kind of filtering, has been uh, uh, affecting uh, internet access in um, in in Canada, um, and be based on all of these things, um, a bunch of people in Toronto uh, gathered at Civic Tech Toronto, um, which is which is a place in Toronto where people get together to talk about the civic and technology. Um, and this group of decentralized people have been called uh, Toronto Mesh. And, and some people have called Toronto Mesh a soccer club for the internet because it is decentralized. A lot of these people gathered for various reasons that weren't necessarily uh, related to each other. Um, for example, I, I came to Toronto Mesh because I was interested in uh, low power sensor networks. There are other people who came into Toronto Mesh because they were interested in access to the World Wide Web. Um, um, uh, um, this is sort of the vision for Toronto Mesh, uh, increasing open, lower cost access to the World Wide Web, uh, building a resilient and redu redundant network, um, providing agency to make important decisions about privacy, uh, improving autonomy to access information in a free manner, and uh, create an opportunity to, opportunity to develop technical literacies. Um, one of the things that we've been trying to do is cultivate a spirit of sharing um, uh, and trying to build a sustainable community. Um, so uh, we've been running these workshops. This is actually based on a toolkit that Commu Commotion Wireless produced. Um, so during this workshop, we built these hypothetical networks in th the city um, and therefore it kind of spread information about uh, 
the way these networks might set, uh, might be set up and how we can share this information on. Um, this is another picture from the commercial wireless workshop that we ran. Uh, another thing we did was, was we built this uh, we built this game, uh, which we set up for t uh, at uh, the Maker Festival in Toronto. Um, and the theme of the game was um, that the internet was shut down uh, in the city, and uh, we got kids and families to set up their own networks within the city, um, um, and therefore created this conversation around uh, DIY networks in the city. Um, we've been publishing a lot of our results and technologies online. So this is a picture of um, an antenna test that we ran uh, last year. Um, we've also been using decentralized um, uh, uh, systems for sharing our, our, our information. So this is a picture of um, the ride client that we use on uh, the Matrix uh, Federated chat system. Uh, we have other mesh networks that are part of this uh, system as well. So the Philly mesh uh, and NYC mesh are part of this network. I'm going to get Ben to talk about some of the technology. Hello. Uh, so, uh, so some of the things that you talked about became uh, our guiding principles in how we choose technologies to use. Um, we want to build stuff that is accessible and reproducible. Uh, so uh, something like Raspberry Pi hardware is uh, something that people from anywhere can easily get access to. Uh, and the software, if it runs on one, it will run on another. Uh, we want our work to be not just the, the stuff we produce is not just local, it can be taken somewhere else and, be, and, and used. Uh, and we're not focusing only on decentralized infrastructure, but also applications. Uh, so we do a lot of integration with stuff like IPFS and SSB, which try to like bring the content into the mesh network itself. Uh, and when we deploy technologies or when we build technologies, we always think about how to document things well and uh, have active support channels where it's, it's more real time. People can like hop onto our chat and, and immediately uh, or like within the hour get some kind of answer. Uh, we maintain three software projects. Uh, the prototype repository is mostly for tinkering. Basically, you need to flash an image onto uh, like Raspbian or Debian onto an SD card, and you run this installation script. It will install the mesh routing software, and uh, it also has scripts to install something like IPFS, so it's easy for you to tinker and mess with. Uh, the the thing the plan for something that's more production ready is uh it's a minimal OS image that you can f that, that you can run on these single board computers and we named it Mesh Orange. Uh, this is still work in progress. Uh, lastly, we're building a suite of monitoring software that includes this web UI that you see. Uh, we're hoping to not only show the physical locations of nodes but also uh, some information real-time information about the nodes. Uh, each node would be doing metric reporting, and we want anyone to be able to run collection software on that data. Uh, in terms of hardware, uh, because we're doing end-to-end -end encryption on, uh, on all the traffic, uh, we are running them not on traditional router, soft router hardware, uh, we're, we're running on single board computers, which are more powerful. So the Raspberry Pi and the Orange Pi Zero are the two that we currently support. Um, in terms of radios, there's the TP-Link that, that has the Atheros uh, driver and uh, the, this, <laughs> this USB dongle that, that we found that we ordered from the manufacturer from in China. And that's uh, it's a $6, uh, six dollar American uh, MediaTek dongle. Uh, these two, we find that over long distances, they are just not great. Um, but in workshop situations, or like if you want to try things out in your in your apartment, you can you can use these to run mesh nodes and build a mesh that's pretty autonomous. Um, for longer distance links, we're only starting now to uh, experiment with Ubiquity and Microtech stuff. Um, in general, we're we're running CJDNS, 
over a 802.11s mesh point or ad hoc link, or it can be a Ubiquity link, it can be a Microtik link, it doesn't really matter what that is, because uh, for now we just, we're not building our own uh, uh, hardware or antennas, we're, we're relying to, uh, on the CJDNS to do all the encryption and then just treat that uh, radio as a, some kind of transport. Uh, if you're not familiar with CJDNS, uh, it's an encrypted mesh software that that's, that takes the the encryption uh, the, the encryption key and hash that into an IPv6 address. So every node gets their unique address. It's a self-addressing protocol, uh, in and and your IP address is in this uh, FC00 IPv6 space. Uh, it, you can you can do peering uh, through you you, you can do peers over the internet with UDP peering, or you, you can peer uh, over Ethernet frames. Uh, that allows us to run one uh, s or or ad hoc links. CJDNS also supports a IP tunnel feature, which is like a VPN. Uh, you're using your your the mesh as the carrier for for your VPN tunnel, and you can set your own exit gateway that's also running the CG, the CJDNS IP tunnels as a server. Uh, on a on a reliable transport such as an Ethernet cable, we can pull uh, 80 megabit per second on a Raspberry Pi three. Uh, all encrypted traffic, but if we have a lossy wireless link, that drops to like 10 or less. Uh, current status, all, almost all our nodes are running the prototype software, uh, and there are about 20 nodes in, the, in Toronto Mesh, but of all Hyperborea, which is all the CJDNS nodes worldwide, there are more than 4,000 nodes. Uh, the, the plan for Toronto is to create a sizable community that, um, that that are able to manage their nodes. Meanwhile, we can build that knowledge base about hardware, um, antennas, and so on. Uh, and also, we can polish uh, the monitoring suite that we're building. And in December uh, uh, this month, we set up the first physical link over 300 meters from two balconies. And it's a ubiquity light beam. The plans for 2018, uh, we have, we are starting to work with uh, local libraries, uh, and we are launching a workshop series in April. Uh, we we feel that libraries are most knowledgeable about the, their the local demographic, and like through them, we can we can uh, we we can do the right kind of uh, workshop for that community. Um, more nodes on the map, uh, get the monitoring stuff working properly, and we're planning a state of our networks conference, which we did last year, but we're trying to do a bigger event this year. Uh, this is the link to the conference in July. Uh, yeah, I want to share some of the observations we had uh, starting this Toronto Mesh Group in 2015. Uh, most people, the f some of the first questions is like, do you have a physical network? Uh, the answer is not really, uh, and still not really. Um, yeah, I find that hard to answer. <laughs> Uh, the other challenge we had was people coming to the website. They find it very difficult to navigate all the materials that we're publishing because, like, some of them is on GitHub, some of them is somewhere else. We were always struggling to like, well, what's the best way to onboard someone? Uh, we're always trying to be more inclusive. Uh, in, in the in the beginning, we very early on we established a code of conduct. Uh, uh, doing the workshops through the libraries is another initiative to kind of get more um, diverse people in, not just uh, not just peer, people who are interested in tech or experienced in tech. Uh, we are also looking to hold meetups, not at the same place every time, but reach more diverse neighborhoods. Um, the Matrix channel with an IRC bridge worked really well for us. Uh, initially, a lot of stuff happened on IRC, and it's getting getting on that is a challenge for a lot of people. And since we started the Matrix channel, we bridged with many other uh, mesh locals in North America. And uh, there, uh, uh, there's a lot more information sharing going on. Uh, I would also want to take this opportunity to 
introduce or show that there are many mesh networks in North America at various stages of uh, maturity. And some of them we work more closely with. And there's Pseudomesh, who is uh, a group in Oakland. They, they develop the software and the technology for the People's Open Network. And they're also doing a build your own internet workshop series. And I know they have uh, that they, they have like days where it's like open house. People come in and then they show them how to like uh, make Ethernet cables and stuff like that. Uh, they are working with Secure Scalabot to build a disaster radio over 900 megahertz. Uh, Philadelphia Mesh. Uh, they they host one of the headquarters. They host a headquarter of one of the largest national ISPs. A lot of residents work for it, which means there's a lot of people with that skill, but then they may also not be so interested in having a community network. Um, so it go, goes both ways. Right now, they're targeting um, targeting the technical hobbyists, um, and they hope to build a security and privacy-focused network. Um, some of the challenges they had, uh, they find it difficult to get people interested constantly and uh, it's hard to find the right hardware for what they want to do. And that concludes our presentation. Uh, oh, and some well, we have more Toronto Mesh people here actually. There's Sarah and Don and uh, Hamish who is not in, not, not in Toronto but he works on the, the Mesh Orange image. Uh, and Aaron is not here but he's also with Toronto Mesh. Thanks. Is there a question session? Yes. Hello. Uh, Hello. I'm interested in the actual uh, mesh routing you use. I uh, use uh, 802.11s uh, right. um, and use uh, CGDNS over it. Right. Uh, but uh, you use uh, the 811 as uh, as for the mesh layer. I mean, uh, it does the meshing really, uh, and CGDN DNS just more or less happens to, to run on it. Um, well, because the thing is, uh, because uh, as far as I know, 811 uh, S uh, supports up to I think 31, 32 nodes uh, where you can mesh, um, and that's uh, that's the limit. Um, and my question was, if you use uh, CGDNS uh, and have the meshing disabled and use uh, CGDNS for meshing on the Wi-Fi wi links, or is it uh, in some other way? So I'm not sure what the limit is with 11S, but I know there is a small limit. Uh, we actually use uh, MeshPoint with, with meshing disabled. We're using it as an ad hoc link. So kind of like the other way of what you're saying. Uh, we're we're not using AL one uh, to eleven as meshing. <laughs> uh, That's, uh, what I wanted to know. Right, uh, but we're also looking into a hybrid. Uh, like maybe f in a small domain, we can enable routing. So because CJDNS is not. <coughs> The routing in CJDNS is terrible. <laughs> I know. <laughs> yes, it 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 it, it doesn't least hop. It doesn't. If I have a long, if I have a really weak signal far away, or a really good two hop, it will take the really bad path because it's one hop away. With CJDNS, you have to. I don't know. It's, well, uh, you have to. Um, uh, Enable peering. You have to peer uh, peer manually. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. No. Okay. Um, yeah. With CGDNS, you have to peer manually, and uh, I think it uh, does automatic peering um, on local networks. Uh, yeah. So that would be something I would be interested in to know. But yeah. I can come afterwards. So. Uh, yeah. If uh, you. So, so on the on Ethernet, it actually does peer automatically, and it beacons. Uh, on the on the UDP interface, uh, it doesn't. But there's no reason why it can't be implemented. Um, thank you very much for presenting Toronto Mesh. Um, tonight at 10 p.m. we have uh, the. Our drink up at our meetup domo right there, and I I'm happy if you 
come and join us and uh, get uh, do some networking with other network communities. 